Welcome to the Behind the Frame podcast, hosted by me, Rebecca Yale. I'm a destination wedding photographer and educator working in the luxury marketplace, and on this podcast, I'll be pulling back the curtain, sharing what goes on behind the scenes working in the luxury wedding industry. Hey friends, welcome back to the Behind the Frame podcast. Today, I am incredibly excited to welcome a very, very, very special guest, world-renowned photographer, John Dolan. John Dolan has woven a career of advertising, editorial, and fine art photography over the past 30 years. He is the author of The Perfect Imperfect, The Wedding Photographs of John Dolan, published by Damiani Books. Recent clients include Naomi Biden, Anna Sophia Robb, and Kate Bosworth. And on a personal note, John has been hugely influential to me and my career. I took a course with him at the International Center of Photography in 2011, and he was the first to show me that there really was a place for artists in wedding photography and that it was a career that I really actually wanted to pursue and I look up to him so much as both an artist and an educator and I'm so grateful to him for the lasting impact that he's had on our entire industry so welcome John and thank you so much for being here uh what a sweet welcome I appreciate it I'm really glad to talk to you, Rebecca thank 2011 you. I couldn't remember when that class was that's a long time ago yeah, it was right after I left NYU and I was trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next with my career? And I was, um, you probably don't remember, I will not be offended. Um, I was doing wildlife photography at oh, the time. I do remember. Yes, yeah, of course. And I was like, I don't know, wedding, weddings to me were seers. It was like, I, I had never seen work like yours and you opened up my eyes to a whole new world and left so many you and Holger are both so many um, golden nuggets that I still use to this day of navigating. Well, it's, it's interesting that even in 2011, wedding photography was not especially cool. It's really just in the last five or I don't know, 10 years maybe, but it's um, those early days that, you know, 2000s and uh, up till 2011, it was still a little bit kind of disrespected by the mainstream photography world. And um, it was interesting to find people at ICP who were willing to take that class. And it was always a mixture of people. <laughs> uh, I know in the end, we changed the name to it. Uh, it was, I think it started off being a different approach to weddings, but then we went and changed it to how not to be a wedding photographer. So we wanted oh, to, to turn that. people upside down a little bit. I love that. For anyone, the context of what we're talking about, I took a course with John Dolan at the International Center of Photography, ICP in New York, and they have the finest instructors in the world there. I um, took courses with Mary Ellen Mark. Uh, I'm trying to remember who else, just like all like anyone you'd see at MoMA and uh, John and Holger Toss were teaching uh, the the different approach, I think, when I took it. And yeah. uh, I cannot recommend um, John's education or just being in his orbit enough for some inspiration. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about his book towards the end, but if you just need some inspiration, uh, I usually tell people to look outside the wedding world for inspiration because we all get mm. so bogged down on Instagram and now TikTok, I guess, uh, which that's a whole different <laughs> subject, but I, I love looking at going to museums and just looking outside of our immediate sphere. And I feel like your work feels like that to me. It feels like mm. the work of a true artist, which I think nice. is what we all aspire to be. Well, that's the goal. The goal was always to be a photographer at a wedding as opposed to a wedding photographer. So it's just, you know, I was that, I was always obsessed with people under pressure and people, uh, families going into these conflict situations and see what happens. Uh, so it was kind of a, it was a natural thing for me. And I love photographing women. I love photographing uh, live events where I can't control things. Some photographers hate that lack of control and I love it. It's, it's my happy place. I always say that wedding days are like, I'm horrible at sports, so I will not make a sports metaphor, but I say they're like the big game and we have to be like professional athletes, like ready to zig and zag as our couples yeah. <laughs> zig and zag. No, it's a good analogy. And some days you, you have a, you know, you don't have a great game. Some days you really rock it, but it is, it's a live performance, which I think makes it thrilling. Um, 
I mean, a lot of people talk about the anxiety of weddings and they get anxious, they get nervous and stuff. For me, it's adrenaline and it always kicks into gear. It's like, this is, this is now we have to deliver. Um, and really one of my missions has always been that weddings are so unique and so important that to make mediocre pictures is really just uh, a shame because it's, it's the time to take risks and go for it and do something fantastic uh, rather than just play it safe. Playing it safe is kind of failure and, uh, from my point of view. I love that. I always say when I'm in consults with my couples that, you know, if I'm getting along with them, I'm hoping that it's me. But no matter what I say to them, your wedding is too important to work with anyone but the perfect person for you. If that's right. not me, I will try not to be offended. But this is too important. You deserve exactly who you are who is going to cover the day the way you want it to be covered. And I say to my clients as well, that I care more about their weddings than they do. And the day that stops is yes. the day I'm done. Oh, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we... listening, steal my line. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you think about it, we definitely know more about what their wedding will be like than they do. Yes. And I think, you know, a lot of people, uh, work out of insecurity when they're planning their wedding. So they, over you could tell the people who've read the blogs about 10 questions to ask your photographers uh and it's do you still get asked how many weddings you've done <laughs> luckily i don't Thank but God. it's uh <laughs> i do <laughs> yeah it's yeah people they're trying to ask those right questions when in fact the the really great people they trust you quickly and once once a the trust has been established it's just it's off to the races it's such a a glorious relationship that um if i know a client trusts me i'm going to take risks i'm going to be loose i'm going to be in a, in a really perfect place to to succeed and if they doubt me then it's you know you can feel that doubt and that over controlling thing and you know, I've, I've learned how to weed those people out, but I know that's a big challenge, certainly when you're starting out, is who right. to, who are your people. Trust is everything. Otherwise, like everyone's shoulders are up here all day. Yeah. Everyone feels <laughs> that's some like, okay, shoulders dropped, get comfortable. That's, exactly. That's the start. Well, I feel like I could just chat with you all day and I'm going to make do my best to be a good <laughs> interviewer here. Um, and before we, we dive too far in, um, I, today we're going to talk about the intersection of art and commerce and how to stand out as a unique artistic voice. But before we get into all of that, I'd love uh, for you just to share a little bit about your journey into wedding photography and how you became who you are today, which I know that could be an hour just or m multiple hours in and of itself. So you can give us the the sound bite. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 could, I can definitely do that because it's, I've been thinking about it lately because those... Um, you know, when you look at a career, a freelance career is really a set of cobblestones. You get each job and it goes to the next one and every job leads to something else. Um, and my early weddings were for friends, like a lot of people will do. Um, but they were people who knew my photography and just had me come to their wedding. And I, you know, they'd pay me 500 bucks or, um, uh, pay expenses or whatever, but I was always able to do whatever I wanted and then I started showing those pictures around when back in the old days, you'd go to a magazine to try to get magazine work. So I would show my portfolio to the editors and then I'd have a little box of prints and they'd see these wedding prints. And I was, you know, shy to show them because weddings were so low on the totem pole. But, you know, a lot of people, a lot of these photo editors were in the zone of getting married. So I started getting weddings from photo editors and writers and art directors and just people in the New York uh, visual scene. And then I would do magazine work for them and then I would do advertising work and then I would shoot their wedding and then I'd see their whole family and then we become this next level of friend. So uh, I'd say in the first five years of shooting weddings, it was really for a lot of really interesting people who loved good photography and didn't want a wedding photographer. So, um, and then, um, I had this hot tip from a 
uh, a magazine uh, agent who said that Martha was about to start a new we wedding magazine. That was 1994, 95. So that was really my big break. And I was in the first issue and I was off to the races after that. And you photographed many of her covers um, for both the magazines and the books, right? You know what? I never got a cover. Really? I, I got... thought you... That's... It's so <laughs> that's so funny. My whole first episode was about external validation and in my and how we set these goals for ourselves and for so long like that was my like I was like I've made it when I have a yes. cover and I thought you had had dozens. So, so anyone listening, here you go. You don't need a cover <laughs> to make it. <laughs> covers are particular. Th no, it's interesting. Covers were always a problem for me because my pictures were never that perfect or that um they were always more real life. I don't think I ever got a cover, but I may be wrong. But I got a lot of spreads, which was always kind of my main goal was to have, you know, a six, eight, ten page spread. I mean, who does that anymore? Whoever did that. And that was uh that was a bigger storytelling technique. Um but the, the real thing that Martha did was she validated uh, this artistic approach to weddings that she hired a lot. She basically hired non wedding people to shoot all their stories. So she would have these incredible still life photographers shooting flowers and cakes and things. And I mean, it's really revolutionary. Now we all take it for granted. But if you ever saw a wedding magazine from the eighties, you'd see how bad the photography was. And then after 95 it just went crazy so uh everybody owes a, a bit of respect to to what martha did and what all the people who came out of that world all those editors were just the highest um level of of visual people i ever met yeah i think without martha i probably wouldn't be doing this because as you said those 80s photos my parents got married in 1975 that's what i mm. thought my my own bat mitzvah was 2001 and like that to me was wedding party photography was that which was horrible it was cheesy i have photos for if anyone's watching on youtube where like my hands are under my chin and i'm like they're horrible and i hated the process of taking yeah. those photos so that's what i thought it was but then when i took your class and I started reading Martha. I don't think I read Martha until your class probably. And then, gosh, I right. started studying it like it was my Bible. Uh, and I saw, wait, these still lifes look like the Irving Penn still life book that I have on my shelf right there. Exactly. And these documentary moments look like Deanne Arbus, which that's, I remember when I took your class, I kind of, in my head, I was like, huh, if Deanne Arbus shot weddings, it probably looks something like this. And I mean that with the highest of compliments. Yes. Um, that's what I thought of. The first time I you met know, you. That's so interesting because I was reading, um, I was going through her one of her big books that has all of her notebooks and everything. Um, and maybe it was six months before she committed suicide, she was assigned by the London Times to photograph Patricia Nixon's wedding at the White House. So I, I, I found this out before I photographed Naomi Biden's wedding. But she was... Uh, she was a press photographer, so they put her in the pool with all the other press photographers. And she wrote in her notebook that she basically got nothing from the shoot because they they locked her into this sweaty tent, and most of the guys had long lenses and you know got a few pictures. But she was not able to have the freedom that I was able to have. It was so interesting, you know, because I would have loved to have seen her shoot a, a White House wedding or any wedding. I think she shot, I've seen one or two of her pictures from weddings and they're very spooky of bridesmaids or, or flower girls. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I recommend to all photographers to, to make sure you have studied the history of photography. Uh, and like you say, not just look at Instagram with uh, contemporary photographers, but really dig deep into what has been done before us and, because uh, I think I came out of a very classical training with photography and uh, was obsessed with history and uh, and museums and things. And uh, certainly when I started, there was no way to look at other wedding photographers, except you go to somebody's house and they show you their pictures and you just, <laughs> they were so bad. I'd love to see your parents' weddings from 75 because 
the seventies were the dark time for wedding photography. It was just no craftsmanship. It was cheap the or, or very formulaic and the color processing was unstable. So they're probably faded pictures on the walls. And, you know, it was well, just, they're not people even... took that for normal. They're not even on the walls because they hated them so much, which is so funny that growing up, like I didn't, um, I say like weddings were the last thing on my mind. And I wasn't that girl who fantasized, like even just in my own personal life, I I didn't get married until last year and I'm 35. Um, I wasn't fantasizing about my fairy tale wedding. Like I was fantasizing about being a CEO. Uh, and that's, uh, that's who my parents were very, um, very driven people. And they're the one wedding photo that like, I really do have of theirs is like, they're holding my mom's bouquet together. And I'm like, was it heavy? Yes. Like what's, what's happening here? Um, and the photographer's assistant is in the back of so many of the photos, which they call an Igor. That's amazing. That's um, amazing. <laughs> what I love is they have, they met really young in college. My mom, I think was, um, 18 or 19 when they, my mom was like 20, Two, I think when they married, she had skipped yeah. two years of, of high school. Like, yeah. So they were so, so young. And there's a photo of them in college. It's a Polaroid. And I, I have it in my office where uh, my mom's kind of leaning back into my dad and he's got his arms wrapped around her and their, their eyes are a little bloodshot. I think they're probably a little drunk uh, and they just look so happy. And that to me, when I talk about engagement photos, like when people are like, do I do engagement photos? And I'm always like, yes, they're amazing. They're this little time capsule of who you are. Like, don't make yes. them this weird, cheesy thing. Thing. like make them this beautiful time capsule that's a gift not well maybe to like your older self and you're like oh look how like young and hot I was like that's fair yeah. especially for us ladies we like that um but it's really for your not even your kids your grandkids of this is who you were and like oh what a gift that is I always thought it'd be cool to do engagement pictures and then only give them a few and put the rest away and send them to them in five years or ten years you know when you really want to look back and see <laughs> what you were what what that magic was because it is a unique time um but it's also interesting i bet your grandparents wedding pictures are beautiful they are and that's so funny i always i talk about that all the time that i only have one from each of their weddings for my uh dad's parents i have them exiting um we're jewish exiting their temple uh and there's so much joy and her the movement in her dress it's just a candid photo and then the other of my mom's parents is real it's a pose like they went into the studio i don't even know if it was their wedding day or if they put their outfits back on but they're they look so beautiful and so like regal almost and i uh, i I love both of them. That's exactly and right. They're black, they're black and white. Yes, both black and white. Yeah. A little yeah. sepia from fading over time. I have scanned them to have them saved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Well, I feel like, again, we could just keep chatting about this, but I- <laughs> I, would... I definitely diverge, so- <laughs> No, I like, your... <laughs> and me too. And I feel like um, I was I was talking to my husband this morning saying that we could probably have 5 million sessions just with even within the topic that I'm about to lead us into, um, which I'm so excited to hear your thoughts on as being an artist. How do you, how have you navigated being your own artistic voice while creating commissioned work. I'd love to hear um, that's something that I struggled with when I was starting. And I think a lot of people do, and it's so important to have a unique artistic voice. That's why people hire you. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you reconcile those in your own head. So this is the art and commerce balance. This is the art and commerce balance. Dig into you the did... Warhol talk. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting because it's um i think a lot of people fall into the trap once they get on the wedding train and they see you know i can charge five thousand dollars for wedding do 30 weddings all of a sudden i'm making this much maybe i'm shooting maybe i'm charging ten thousand and and you're so focused on the acquisition of the next job and uh and i think I can probably show you a chart of my nineties where I started getting more and more weddings and going like this and going from 10 to 12 to 20 to 30 and then just crashing. And my third child was born in 99. I think in 2000, I just went down went from 30 to four because I just couldn't put the suit on and leave my wife with three kids. And, but I was also shooting magazine work 
I was also shooting advertising work or catalog work for Sundance. Um, so my business model was this 30, 30, 30 thing, 30% editorial, 30% advertising or catalog and 30% weddings. And once I gained that balance back going down to four weddings and up to 10 or 12, then I really hit my stride where it was a, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It was more nutritious, balanced diet and not just all one thing. Um, and I think that's harder now where there's no magazine work and there's not that much advertising, but I think it's a goal that if you, if there's any way you can figure out anything to do besides just more and more and more weddings and getting people underneath you and building a studio, I, I think that model is, can be really, uh, narrowing creatively. So if I did a advertising job, I would learn how to work with a big crew. If I did an editorial job, I learned storytelling. If I did catalog, I learned how to work with models and, but also, um, uh, react, bring some art to the commerce. Uh, so it was a really, uh, I'm, I feel really fortunate to have had that diversity of the career. Um, and it's much harder now. I don't know when my last editorial job was, but now I'm doing more nonprofit stuff and more uh, personal commissions and um, family portraits for people I know, uh, sort of family documentary. And But you just have to keep finding ways to mix it up. And in the early days now, you have such a distinguished and well-known voice. I always say when, I, when I'm teaching that the goal is for someone to be able to look at a photo and know it's yours, that that's the goal of any artist, whether we're a painter, photographer, sculptor, whatever it is, like that's always our goal. And I think now that's, you're so distinct. In the early days when you were building your business, did you ever struggle with clients perhaps wanting um something that didn't feel as you like how did you show your clients this is what I do and make sure you're getting those right clients who wanted that it was really hard it was really hard because I didn't have my style down I had I was imitating a lot of people um I was trying every different uh, trying to experiment on jobs and flopping and um I mean I'm certainly one of these people who learned by failing and until I realized that uh, instead of thinking what I was good at, I realized what I was bad at. I was bad at studios. I was bad at shooting corporate men in offices. I was bad at lighting. I was, you know, I started going down all this list and um, it left me with this this core of who I was as a photographer. And uh, I had an agent who came up with this phrase that I made real people look beautiful and beautiful people look real, which was helpful at least to, uh, so I was shooting a lot for Real Simple Magazine and I would do these stories of, um, you know, a woman who had started a business, she'd been through some health problems and I'd spend the day with her family and I'd make her look really just like a hero. And then I'd shoot some um, uh, models or celebrities and make them a little bit stripped down and more natural. And that was helpful to me to figure out this is my superpower. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of that kind of introspection and carving out which pictures just are boring or look like somebody else's or, you know, you know, in your gut when you, just you didn't succeed and you learn from that and apply uh i mean it's so much about finding people you collaborate with and that's the glorious thing finding art directors and client wedding clients and then it's then you then you really feel your muscles working
I love that so much. I always think of the Richard Avedon photo of Marilyn Monroe that is now very famous. It's hanging in MoMA uh, of her at the end of a session when he had finished. I know, of course, you know this photo for people listening and who don't. Uh, I will show it right here um, and link it in the show notes. But it's her just taking a sigh that she was she's always performing she always has this this almost mask on of Marilyn Monroe and it's like so many people say it's the only real photo of Norma Jean like once she had become Marilyn Monroe because she's just sighing and just like being vulnerable for a second and that photo was so influential to me early in my career of okay, let's try to like get people to take that mask off. So I, I say to my clients, like, I love working with the people who are a little bit more nervous, a little bit more shy, the people who are super confident in front of the camera, they're not fun to photograph because they're wearing those masks and they're doing weird poses. And you're like, okay, relax, (laughs) shake it off. Um, So I love like, that's, I I hope that is on your website somewhere. That's the perfect little tagline for you of making these these beautiful people feel real and that's you have worked with so many incredible celebrities who must be used to being just on all the time how do you work with them to let them have that sigh and let them feel real what's that process like uh you know i direct very little and i think that so many people um i think a lot of photographers think that you need to tell your your subjects what to do and uh, it's taken me years and years to learn this thing that of trusting myself and trusting the interaction as me as a human being with this person is much more important than me as a photographer with this person. So uh, there's so much of what I don't do that allows this space for somebody just to realize that something else is going on with this photographer. I mean, if you're a uh, person who gets photographed all the time, I think sometimes you you do put on the mask, you put on the armor because you're being uh, not assaulted, but you're being told, you're directed all the time from photographers, from paparazzis, from film directors, from everybody. So uh, I do this completely opposite thing of just being and and it's not like I'm mute and not like I'm a documentary photographer. I'm just more like, um, I mean, I use this mental thing that I'm more like a cousin or a cousin with a really good camera or, uh, and it, and it gives this kind of, I'm just normal basically. And I think I've noticed that a lot of people I photograph really, um, feel that that's a gift that I'm not, imposing on them i'm not changing their reality i'm not um, my daughter came up with this phrase a lot of people in life assign emotions where and parents do this a lot to their kids like you're hungry you're tired so go take a nap or you're uh, a lot of photographers will do this where they'll say well you know put your heads together and whisper in each other's ear i can't say those words to <laughs> to clients so I get them in a position of comfort and then I say, whatever you feel is great. So just let it out. Don't fall back and don't, don't, don't um, put a mask up for me. I'm not expecting anything. So removing expectations is a big part of it. There's a line, I think it's Alfred Eisenstadt quote that it's more important to click with people than to click the shutter. That oh, nice. I, yeah, is That's that a great really one? Good. I, really I love good. that. And uh, I would love to hear though, since I am someone who art directs more and I'm always, I, when I teach, I try to tell people like, there's never one way to do things. Hmm. Um, there's other than inauthentic to who you are. So like, that's, that's what I always yeah. try to follow is um, be your truest self and do it consistently. So your clients know what they're getting into, because that's where you get into trouble is if a client ex- is expecting a, and you deliver Z, not even B. Um, but I'd love to hear what you do with clients who are a little bit more anxious. I always joke like for the 30 rock watchers out there when Alec Baldwin was on the show within the show when he got so nervous and he asked for a coffee cup and then he asked for a second and he's like marching around holding the two coffee cups. And that's what I'm like. And you put me in front of a camera. I'm like, where are my coffee cups? My shoulders are up beyond my ears. How do you, what do you do with people, awkward people like me? <laughs> oh, I love awkward people. It's um 
I can't exactly describe what I do because it's like a doctor giving a shot without you knowing it. It's basically that methodology of, of, uh, of not telling, not saying one, two, three, everybody ready. I skip all that stuff. I, the picture's already been taken before you know it, or I'm giving little alternate things that are just give you something to do rather than telling you what I want you to feel. I'm going to put you in a game to make you feel that or something, but it can't be anything cheesy either, or I'll turn red and feel embarrassed. So it's, it's a, it's a delicate process, but it's, I mean, the real thing that I've learned is that there are collectors and directors, and I can tell by your bookshelf that you're a director, and you can probably tell by the <laughs> chaos behind that my wife and I are more collectors. And I think the lesson is that as a photographer, you you should figure out where you are on the spectrum and don't feel guilty for not being a, a collector if you're not a natural, you know, loose photographer. Don't fake it lean into your skill set. Um, and I'm sure that's what you're saying to your students as well, but it's, it's, um, I know how I'd like to be photographed and I would absolutely repel if somebody told me what to do or how to hold my wife's face or whatever. I would just react really negatively. Um, so I'm super sensitive to, uh, especially photographing men. I'm not going to tell another man how to hold his betrothed and uh, and I you know I think it's worth experimenting too at the same time I'm not just one thing so I'll do a group picture with 300 people and I'll stand on top of a car and tell everybody to you know I need people taking a knee and I need people doing this so um, I think I see a lot of photographers trying to position themselves saying I'm this kind of photographer I'm this just a photographer with a range of skills and, um, you know, positive things and negative things. One of the things that I love about weddings so much is you get to be all of those different types of photographers mm. in one day. But when I was, when I was at NYU and I was at art school, I kept being told to pigeonhole myself a little bit. And I was like, well, but like, I like doing the still life and I like doing documentary like I, I want to do both and I was told over and over again you can't like you're never going to get an agent you're never going to get a manager if you're doing too many things no yeah. one's going to know what they're getting when they hire you and I love that in weddings you still like we have our distinct styles but you get to do so many things how I mean now I assume anyone coming to you well actually this is a great question i shouldn't assume are most clients who are coming to you through wedding planners or are you yes. still having people finding you on the street <laughs> it's it's i'd say it's 90 percent wedding planners but that 10 percent is really interesting so i never know where a, a random client's going to come from and sometimes they're just so fabulous and um and I'm sure a lot of photographers found that during the pandemic. I just met, met some absolutely extraordinary people with a good story. And um, But even for planners, I think it's useful to give people a sense of who your, your people are. So for me, it's this kind of triangle or square of shy people. Or um, Actually, the top thing is that people who love photography then it's it's understated people like you were saying there's in most families there's a spotlight sister who loves the show and then i get the other sister um and hopefully it's two people who are really in love because it shows up if it, they're not <laughs> um, but you know i think it's uh, planners call me and say i've got one for you these people you know, they're imperfection. They, they like the imperfection. They like, they don't want to be directed all day. It's a whole kind of a mindset. And then it's a perfect match. So they're not sending me somebody who has a huge shot list and a huge schedule of, they want to get portraits for four hours. And, you know, so I know my people when I meet them and it's a beautiful thing. If you're a different kind of photographer, you're going to have a different set of adjectives of who your people are, but it's a, it's a good winter game to play. Who are your people? 
Did you ever have any struggle earlier in your career of creating commissioned art? I remember for a long time, I had to like keep room and this is I'm sure my own ego talking that um, thank God for therapy. Um, But I had to um, kind of go back and say to myself, like, okay, you can create great work as a commissioned artist. Look at the National Portrait Gallery. Look like, look at Da Vinci, look at Michelangelo, how much of this yeah. work was commissioned <laughs> and it can still be great. It's that, and that's, I made the Warhol joke early, early on when we're like, yes, this is the conversation. Like there's entire artists who made their, their oeuvre about that intersection uh, of what it means to be a working artist. I'd love to hear in your head how you approach that. No, it's a really interesting subject because we are, uh, by nature, we are commercial photographers. We're um, we're craftsmen. We're I don't know what the right word is, but we are um, we're not pure artists. We're guns we for hire. <laughs> we're guns for hire. Well, we're commissioned. Yeah, we're commissioned people, and I think the art world looks scans at wedding photographers because they know they're you know the core thing is we're commercial but i've been it's certainly been my mission to uh it's not a reason not to make art at a wedding it's 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 for me it's even it's like weddings have been neglected as this subject for true study and true concentration for so long because uh, it just seemed like a throwaway genre, you know, it's, it's, it, the equivalent would be like, you know, maybe it's like being a country Western singer at uh, a classical music concert or something. Whenever I'm around serious art photographers, I always feel a little bit like, or I'm like a horror movie director <laughs> at, at uh, you know, the New York film festival or something, but we're this subgenre but that doesn't mean that there's not something great coming out of it. Um, and it's, 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 you know, it's a little bit, I get a little bit chippy about it sometimes, but I'm on, I'm on a mission to raise the genre up and say, there's actually fascinating studies going on every Saturday night. And it's a high wire act as a photographer. If I can make a great picture while I'm walking backwards with no control of the subject or the light or the people around me, that's a pretty good uh, victory. And you know, you compare that to a art photographer who's spending six months on a with an eight by ten camera in some strange place trying to get one shot. Now, there's something. It, it's just a different a different thing. But it's uh, I, I'm. I'm trying to spread this word in the art community too, that, and the advertising world too. Wedding photographers have an incredible skill set, and uh, you know, hire them. I love that. Well, I'd love to go behind the frame with you and talk about one of your probably. I mean, it's funny; it's a more recent photo, but I think now it's a very iconic photo that you took of Naomi Biden at the White House. Um, so for those again watching on YouTube, it's I'm going to put it in right here. Uh, for those of you listening in, it's linked in the show notes. If you're driving, pull over or listen in later. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what went into this incredibly emotional photo. Like I, ha- I have a whole narrative that I've created in my head of what's happening here. But before I, I don't, I don't want to oh, hear, hear that. Hear I want to hear that. <laughs> Um, I just, I, I, to me, it's, it's this feeling and I, I just got married. So I feel, I feel it of, oh my God, of what's about to happen of what, like I can, the light coming in on her and the drop off. And it's, it's the moment of, okay, the doors are going to open and I'm about to get married and what's going to like, it's, it's such a quiet moment, but there's so much anticipation, um, which is so funny. I say that our photos sometimes like we can't um, right now I'm giving you the opportunity to speak for it. But once we put our photos out there, they're out there and we don't attach a narrative to them. So um, they need to like be strong enough like to stand on their own. I had a professor in school who little would draw like little like strong cartoon arms next to our negatives like on on boards and be like, they need to be strong. So if someone tries to knock them down. They can stand on their own. And this image um, like 
you could be like that's not what the moment was at all but i've made this whole narrative around it i hope it's the correct no narrative. it's perfect yeah it's absolutely perfect and it you know it was such a um such not a quiet scene overall the whole weekend we were there there were always people and there were six photographers and there was video and there was white house people and so it was this literal brief i don't know 60 seconds two minutes whatever it was it wasn't a lot of time and there was no one except for naomi and myself and that to me was was this uh gift from the wedding gods and from the white house gods of just um you know, sort of why how I've worked at weddings for 30 years to culminate on this one day at this one moment was incredibly powerful. And it was maybe there was a voice in my head of this is big. I don't think the voice said don't blow it. It just said, you know, just bathe in this beautiful moment. And she bathed in it. She took it in so beautifully too, so gracefully. And there was no awkwardness. There was no self-consciousness. Um, you know, I always imagine we've always seen how people change when they put on their costumes, when they put on their tuxedos or their dresses, they become this other character in this play. And for me, that was this, you know, the character coming from off stage and about to go on to the biggest stage of her life. It was really this, um, uh, just like you described the calm before the storm. Um, but it was about kind of the moment historically and uh, the combination of personal and public was really interesting too. You know, she's having her own personal moment, but she knows the weight of it publicly. And, uh, and there was something about the light in there that was really unique and emotional. This kind of, I don't think it would work as a black and white picture, which is, interesting too a lot of my black and white stuff is stronger but there was something about that glow that was so um just this kind of warmth and the white coming out of the warm light was amazing so yeah it was it was powerful so how did you deal i i in the behind the frame we i really like to ask people to um share because it it seems it seems so effortless from looking at it. Um, but I'm sure that even someone as esteemed as yourself, um, I, I love that you said you didn't feel nervous because I also, I don't feel like once I'm there, as you said, the adrenaline kicks in, like I've dislocated my shoulder multiple times on a wedding day and not even felt it. Cause like we are adrenaline monsters. Like <laughs> We're just machines running yeah. on it. It's like after when you sit down for a second, you're like, Oh, like what just happened in the last 12 hours? It was or 14 hours, whatever. It was a blur. How did you, for yourself, like feeling the gravitas of this, like this is a historical document that, which I hopefully all weddings are historical documents that are going to be cherished by the individual people who were creating them for, but this is national, international. How, how did you prepare for that day? <laughs> um, well, I give a huge amount of credit to Brian Raffinelli, the planner who, when he first talked to me, he said, I want to set you up to succeed. So, you know, you tell me what you need. And throughout the whole kind of rehearsal process, I have this, I had a gut feeling that staying back was my happy place, staying with the bride and not being at the end of the aisle or, you know, catching her halfway or something like that. Um, and Corbin Gherkin was shooting as well, and she had positioned a different thing, uh, a different place for herself. So I chose to be at the back. Um, I mean, I have a mantra, which is never leave the bride. Um, so I knew that I knew that that drama, I anticipated that drama in some way, there'd be something back there. So in our rehearsal, I chose that spot. And it could have been a total flop because uh i didn't know how long she'd be there i didn't know what the situation would be but um i got a few pictures I, I also think transitions are so interesting too so as she moved through the doorway those pictures were 
incredible to me as well because it was a dark interior and then it was a super bright morning in Washington, November, this winter light coming on. And it I, I almost was blinded when I when she walked through the doorway. And I think that that metaphor of weddings where you're going from one thing to another is always fascinating. Um, so I felt, I don't know if she felt that, but I felt she was moving from one part of her life to the next. So uh, I'm, you know, it was really about kind of having a little meditation the day before and saying, what's, how's this going to play out? And where's the drama? Uh, you know, I didn't get any pictures of her, face walking down the aisle but i got the the pre the preamble i love how much thought you're putting into the prep of these images that for whether you are the one to art direct or in that pure documentary space you're still thinking through and planning out with such an art director's eye of where is the action where is the moment how do i want to tell this story and i love how you said transition because i talk about that a lot when i'm teaching because in school we had so many uh, at nyu i had so many documentary professors who talked about positioning yourself and anticipating mm. the action like getting that henri cartier brisson decisive moment the perfect leap like where where do you want to photograph that from and i talk about scoping out the transitions if you know where you're going to take portraits and you know where the ceremony is going to happen as you walk from one to the other, do you want to be in front of the bride? Do you want to be behind? Do you want to, which side do you want to be on? And really paying attention to those things, even if you're letting them unfold naturally, knowing where you want to stand is going to completely change what you're, I say, allowing in your frame, the colors that are going to be behind, where is the light on them or behind them, all those little details. So I love hearing that someone who is so loose in capturing what's in front of them is still having control of what you're allowing i mean i must say this this might be the only time i've ever scouted so fascinating um, yes i never scout i hate scouting because it's it doesn't do anything for me and i'm better at improvising um and i like jazz I'm absolutely jazz as opposed to, I don't read the notes on the thing. So it was, um, I mean, I'm often very resistant to when people do walkthroughs and stuff, because it just doesn't mean anything to me until the character's there with the, the dress and I'm, I'm inspired by the light that is at that moment. Um, so I think that's given me great training to be able to find light really fast. I think that's, I can change film faster than anybody and I can find good light really quickly. So, you know, you learn your skill sets um, because often things change and uh, you have to be able to be nimble. That's one of our greatest skills as, as photographers is to be able to adapt and not freak out when it rains and when something happens. So, uh, but in particular, this wedding was so specifically choreographed we had to ha pick our spots and we weren't supposed to move too much but you know then the whole weekend uh, was built on trust and uh, acceptance and you know everybody trusted us and and the bidens trusted us and and i felt a great amount of uh, freedom once we got going so uh, it's yeah i'm I'm not an art director, but I, I've worked with great art directors and I've learned some of that stuff by osmosis. Um, but it's really interesting you hearing you go through all the things that you think about because I don't think, and it's amazing. There's a, like if you hooked, hooked, hooked up an EKG to my brain or whatever it is, there'd be so little brain activity because it's all just gut and, um, uh, but you know, we all well, have our skills. And I think that's fascinating because it is, it is gut for you. And I think that I started realizing how much I am thinking, like, I don't realize that I'm, or I didn't used to realize that I was thinking about all these things until I started trying to teach it. Um, yeah. Because I, I love <laughs> that you said like way earlier, um, 
about, I, I don't want to go in too many directions with this conversation, but you mentioned something about cheesy photos and I, I, I hate cheesy photos. They're why I was resistant to weddings. I was like the day someone calls one of my photos cheesy, I quit, I'm done. Uh, but when I got into teaching, I really, um, my background is in aesthetic philosophy. So I studied semiotics. So I'm like, how do we, I wanted to be Susan Sontag, like before I was like, no, I actually need to be a photographer. I need to create myself. I was like, I'm just going to talk about photography. So I love the idea of the study of semiotics, the, like creating visual language. How do we derive truth from an imagery, from an image? What makes an image strong? And then how can I use that to help others create strong images who it maybe doesn't feel as innate to, or they're not sure why they're creating something and they know they've created something they love and then something they don't, and they don't know how to pick that apart. So as I got more into teaching, I really tried to break down, okay, for me, a cheesy photo comes from, I call it uncanny valley. It comes from, like you said, having a couple put their heads together. Like if that's something they wouldn't actually do in real life, or my favorite is the couple looking in opposite directions. I call it looking for the ones who got away. Um, If you're creating this image that doesn't feel like it ever could have happened in reality, that's going to be cheesy. That's what creates a cheesy photo. It looks like a robot pretending to be human and it's it's not working. Uh, So I feel like I really tried to analyze um to help others and myself yeah. uh do things more naturally but event- it does have to become natural these decisions you're making have to be done in split seconds why i love the sports metaphor of weddings are the big game all these things need to happen in practice so i i would agree that like maybe the brain activity is is still yeah. because you've already built those neural pathways and they're natural to you and they all are happening in their gut where even when i was trying to learn I I love teaching flat lay styling which I know like that's something that's probably not even in your orbit which is um totally fair that we all have our different things that we love doing um to me one of the reasons I love teaching it is because I joke that it's like it's like getting um people to eat their vegetables that they don't want to it's learning composition and training right. your brain to see these things in like a more controlled easy environment and then you can take that and use it for other things and when I was talking with Shira Savada who was the editor at Martha Stewart Weddings for, a, for the real weddings editor for a very very long time and was a huge mentor of mine she mm-hmm. when I was going over these kind of compositional elements with her she was like Oh yeah, like that's why I do that. But to her, it wasn't like, oh yes, top heavy, bottom heavy, like you gotta do the seesaw. Like it was just gut for her. So yeah. I'll say, like, not all of us are so lucky just to have that gut automatically. <laughs> so well, but this makes me think that uh a lot of younger photographers need to give themselves time to yes. this stuff all takes years and years and years and uh, what I've noticed is there's, since there's no barrier to entry into wedding photography, you get a camera, put it on automatic, go to town. There's a lot of re-education that needs to happen. And I think uh, there's so much pressure on photographers to succeed that they they need to pause and just realize that uh, this stuff I didn't do my first wedding till I've been photographing for 10 years, you know? Wow. So um, maybe that's not true. Maybe five years, but I wasn't paid for, you know, it just takes a long time to establish these things. And, um, and the other point I was going to make with a lot of these photographs, my thing is uh, when you're reading photographs, I need to believe it. So the two people putting their heads together or opposite directions, you when you can hear the photographer's voice that it's it feels to me phony so that's my test of anybody's photographs when i'm re- critiquing someone's work do i believe that it came from the heart or is it did you plop a template on top of these people and say do this thing that i did last week that i sold five eight by ten so everybody do the same shot um as soon as you start slipping into that then you're slipping into uh, the commercial r- repetition, you know, making the donuts the next morning. Uh, for me, it's a, bad photography is like making donuts. You just, you know, you know the recipe, put it in the oven, come out, they're great, but they're not nutritious. So, you know, my goal is to make something new even after 30 years and make something really 
that will be nutritious for generations. I feel like that's the next level of what the term I use when I'm teaching is the captionet rule, where I say for any photo throughout the day, um, whether it is an invitation or a portrait or a documentary moment, if you can't caption it in a way that like makes sense, it probably shouldn't exist. And I'll use the example a lot that I think it's kind of coming out of popularity, but especially when I was starting in like 2010 to like 2014, this real like fine art aesthetic of like trying to look like a model, but like not quite being there where like, there'd always be like weird hands on the face. Like, and I like the weird hands, which I in in my education, I captioned that as a uh, bridesmaid meant to give the bride a mint, but slipped her some Molly. Um, and like, that's kind of the only caption I can come up with for a bride feeling her face on a wedding day. She's just tripping out. So if you're not creating an image that can be easily captionable, I'd say like, mm. let's reflect and rethink a little bit. <laughs> Um, well, I feel like that's all you've kind of answered one of the next question I wanted to ask is if you could go back 20 years in time and tell, tell a younger John, like, it's all going to work out. What, what would you, what words of wisdom would you say to him? I did have this realization a while back that, uh, and I it even happened on Saturday night, I shot a job, shot a birthday party. And I, on Sunday, I realized I should have done X. And my realization is let that stuff go because nobody knows, my client won't know the picture that I have in my head that I should have done and that's okay. And then I learn, I put it in the bank for next time, but basically nobody knows the pictures that you miss. So don't get hung up on it and uh, lean into the pictures that work. And uh, I have this kind of internal thing that, you know, I take these, go on these three day weddings in Italy and come back and I'm exhausted. And my wife looks at me like, how are you standing? And then I'll start showing her some pictures, just some of the digital pictures. And I'll feel myself, I'm drained this much, but I'm filled up this much. And that's kind of the, another balance between art and commerce is, are you creating something that refills your soul? Uh, and, you know, weddings are hard, but it's really not hard work compared to the guys putting up the tent or the people putting the flowers on the, you know, two minutes before the ceremony. I mean, I, I, I definitely won't put up with photographers complaining about how hard it is because, I mean, we are living the golden age of wedding photography. All the people I know who are, you know, able to buy a house from shooting weddings for five years and things. That wasn't happening 20 years ago. So um, no fussing allowed from <laughs> anybody in my orbit because you all are lucky to, you know, to, to make, to get paid to do something really important and to be creative at the same time. So it's, it's a, a sweet spot we're in. I love that. The filling your cup part and how, we might we might drain the emotional, um, might drain our emotional uh, restore storage <laughs> going into yeah. a wedding, but then you fill it back up going through the photos, and I I feel that too. Uh, on why I did one this summer that was five days of events um, over a holiday weekend. And I, uh, my husband came with me, he didn't assist me, but he was hanging out in our Airbnb. And I was just exhausted coming home from it every day. But then seeing the photos I was creating, and it was a large family, and there were kids, and I was just like, I'm doing it. I'm so proud of what I'm creating. And this feels amazing. So I love, I love that you said that, um, that making sure you're, you're balancing. Um, I say like when I'm goal setting, I'm always thinking about like, obviously the finances are important and the lifestyle piece is important of work-life balance, but you have to remember the artistic fulfillment piece because yes, we're artists. Yes. And if yeah. you're not, and all three really need to be addressed because if one of them for a while, like the work-life balance dropped for me and I injured myself, like, I, I love that you were like, it's not that hard. Like it, it, like we're carrying a lot of cameras and often working like 16 hour days in a row. Like I, I tell people you only get one body, try not to break it because yes. I've broken mine a few times. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's keeping all, all three of those things in mind. Um, yeah. Well, I've tried I, to, I've tried to simplify my kid a little bit as I've done, as I've gotten older and 
and keeping it simple and uh and I try to pace myself too. I see I've seen other photographers at weddings and they just look like they're working so hard and I it's it's okay. You could just take a break and sit down and talk to people and have a glass of wine and dance a little bit and the pictures nobody's checking. Did you get a picture of every single moment of the day? Let the video guys do that. It, well, it really, it's like live theater where you said no one knows the line you missed. No one knows right, the exactly. photo, but I love that you are taking that analysis of, okay, I'm going to do this differently next time. Cause that's, that's something that, um, I, I feel like coming from the f like commercial editorial photography background, like we're used to having editors rip apart our work and yes. we're used to reflecting on things. And when I got into weddings, I was astounded that like WPPI and these big conferences didn't have um, portfolio reviews. Like that was always mind blowing. And they still don't. I've, I've tried to bring them and no one wants them. Um, but it's, if it's so important to have someone else give you feedback on your work and to just take that time to be introspective yourself. Um, that when you say you see what photographers working so hard, like my goal on a wedding day, like, yes, I am working very hard, but it's all below the surface. I'm the duck whose little feet are going like this yes. under the surface, but no one should see that on my face, on my demeanor. Like maybe if it's a really hot wedding, I'm a little sweaty, but, uh, <laughs> that's just me. Um, they shouldn't, they shouldn't see you sweat. Um, you should. I, 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 I had a planner, recently just say to me her rule was the photographer should never move faster than a guest so mm. she didn't want to see a second shooter like running to go get a shot before the uh, it's a, just kind of like a note of gracefulness is important that we are part, we are a big part of the wedding everybody sees us constantly and if you have straps everywhere and cameras dangling and lenses falling on the ground it's not cool. <laughs> so it's uh yeah, be part of the be part of the wedding. Absolutely. That's for me, it's having an assistant who can hold some of those. I I have I have I am down to two cameras now myself. I have one digital and one film that I'm switching mm -hmm. between, but I don't even have both. The only moment I have both on my shoulders is when I am actually in the ceremony aisle because I think it's really inter like disruptive to have an assistant run in and hand me something. But um yeah, otherwise I am I'm one camera and we're switching seamlessly. So I, I, for both our backs and for our presentation, yes. <laughs> um, that's, that's important, um, which protect your backs guys. Um, very important. We are, we are carrying a lot of gear. Um, so I would love to, I know I've already taken so much of your time, but mm -hmm. hopefully I can take a little more to talk about your amazing book here. Um, I'd love to hear, well, first I want to, I'm going to show and I'll, I'll show it better. Um, let me see if I can. Whoop, hold it up. I picked one of my favorite images from, from your book, which oh is gosh. this one here. Mm. Um, I just like this, this to me completely exemplifies, I'm trying to get the glare gone, um, exemplifies your work, which for those listening in who can't see it, it is a couple in this beautiful blue light with yellow string lights above it. And uh, just absolute glow and the bride has her arms out and she's spinning and the groom is dancing and it it feel the coloring of it like it feels like a Gregory Crudson photo to me which I love um mm. because his photos are actually so set up um yes. it's like that fine artist that you were talking about who like spends six months and has a whole Hollywood crew to design one photo um and how lucky are we as wedding photographers that we get these beautiful sets that we get to walk into and create within them um but I like I, I like to say that I want my photos to feel like someone press pause at the perfect moment and yes. you could press play and spring back to life and like I mm. like I want to press play on this photo I feel like I'm the kid who like doesn't understand photos anymore and I'm like make it play like <laughs> I want to hit play and watch it spring back to life That's um amazing. I hope you I mean obviously you put this photo in here so you like it too but I'd love to hear a little about the creation of this book and how it came to be and how you began searching through your entire career of photos to pick what to put in here I'd love to hear about that well starting with that picture uh, it's a great illustration of um, me just existing me just being there never leaving the bride because it was in up in Ojai the fog roll it had rained throughout the wedding but they didn't care and the fog came in at the end and i was about to leave and they were just heading over back towards their teepee or yurt or whatever and um 
they were feeling what they were feeling. And it was almost like they just threw me this ball and all I had to do was catch it. And it was, they, I, I, you know, there's a lot of, of reading the room and reading the vibe and sometimes just staying back and letting the scene unfold. And I love that you want to see the scene unfold after that. Cause it was, you know, literally I got five frames, eight frames of that whole scene. Then they ran away and, they're, uh, them running away is also in the book too, uh, maybe a few pages after that, but it's black and white. But it's a, uh, it's this philosophy of that they're on their trip and I can't change their trip or, or else I mess with back to the future sort of thing. So, you know, I, I'm along for the ride and I'm present, but I'm not interjecting and telling them, okay, guys, spin around and dance and, and I think that's this kind of faux documentary thing that I think people slip into. And it's, you know, just, it's so wonderful to um, not interject yourself and still get the picture. Um, but to move on to the, the book was something I worked on for 10 years, maybe more, 15 years. So I always kept a, a keyword in my Lightroom catalog. Uh, I, you know, I was calling the book I do in the old days. And so I just would mark certain pictures and pin them up on a wall and uh, make a dummy. I think I've made probably six full dummies of this book before I found a publisher. And I shopped it around and I got rejected by all the big houses in New York. And, um, and the conversation, it wasn't even a, much of a conversation. They'd just say, why would people want to look at other people's wedding pictures? Like that was literally a comment somebody said to me. Um, or they would say, oh, you know, that would be cute in the gift department. Or um, maybe if you had a celebrity on the cover, we'd consider it. But um, I know I worked for InStyle magazine a bunch of times in the 90s, and they wanted to do a wedding book. And they had to reprint the cover three times because the celebrities kept getting divorced. <laughs> so they ended up putting flowers on the cover because they just said, forget it. We're never going to be able to do this. But um, my celebrities don't get divorced. <laughs> Not touch wood. Um, but it it really was this process of uh, banging my head against the wall for years and years because as soon as I mentioned the W word when I was talking to a publisher, they would just shut down. So um, it was in the middle of the pandemic. I went to a, a book designer named y Yolanda Cuomo. Who, she taught at NYU a bunch. And I brought her my final dummy, which was really pretty close to the final book. It was maybe 70% of the way there. And I showed that to her. And then she match made me with Damiani in Italy and um, they, the Italians got it right away. And, uh, so that book sold out six months ago and we're, I'm pretty close to, to, uh, figuring out to do a second edition with about 35 new pictures. So it's kind of an expanded I'll have to edition. get another copy. That's okay. I can have, <laughs> I can have one for upstairs, one for downstairs. That, that sounds perfect. Uh, this yeah. actually does reside downstairs in my living room. I'm I'm upstairs right now in this is this is actually my husband's library. It's his, he's a documentary filmmaker, so this is his little screening room. But I've I've taken it over for podcasting, so I will have to have a second copy. Can you let people know where they can find it, and I'll make sure to link it in our show notes. Well, theoretically, it should come out in the fall um, at bookstores and on my website. And uh, stay stay tuned to Instagram to hear more about it. Oh, I'll make sure you guys in the show notes for this, you'll find his Instagram link. So you can make sure you stay tuned because if you, you need your copy on your coffee table, this is, this is so beautiful. And I have, if you can't tell behind me, I have quite a few books. Um, and I'll say this is one that so many friends when they come over have leafed through. And I'm always like, clean your fingers first. Um, <laughs> I am that crazy person with my coffee table books, no sticky fingers. Um, I'm, I'm a little crazy, but I like speaking of books, I think it's out of frame, but over there I have a copy of the family 
family of man and family of woman, mm. which were actually my grandparents' additions that I was, I could not believe. I think I cried when I found them um, when we cleaned out my grandmother's house on Long Island years ago. And they Amazing. were the original copies um, of both shows. And which for anyone who isn't familiar with those shows, they were kind of the family of man, at least was the first real um, like seminal photography exhibit at there had been others at um at MoMA and other museums but this was like really the first big one that kind of put photography on the map as a real art form and it like it, it didn't do well at first there because they were portraits because they were um a lot of family photos and I mean not of the photographer's families but taking um of families all over the world and um but now it's considered um revolutionary in in our field so I think like going back to the history of photography and what it is to negate weddings is such a mistake. Um, although I will say like, it depends on how the wedding is photographed because there yeah. is a difference um, between creating real, real art and real documenting of the time versus um, these cheesy images that. Um... So it's so interesting. You mentioned the family of man, because I do have a dream of, some great museum doing a survey of wedding photography in that same way and raising it up to a an art level so it's one of my side projects oh i love that let's uh let's chat about that uh <laughs> offline sometime i'd love to to help make that happen i won't i won't be so bold to put my own to say i belong there but i love the idea of it and uh I time is that, right for that... sure that's so fascinating. I love what you said er earlier that there's no barrier for entry into weddings um, is very true. And I, I, when I first started in it, because I was coming from NYU where I had been <laughs> told so many times um, all these things that I needed for success and uh, was putting so much pressure on myself of these like awards that I had to get and lists I had to be on and things of external validation. And then I got into wedding worlds and I was like, wait, there are people who are doing great and their photos are terrible. Like what's happening? Like there are photos of people looking in the opposite direction. And I was really angry at the beginning because I was in my young twenties and I was, I was stupid yeah. um, as many, you know, which is like, sorry for anyone out there in your young twenties, I'm sure you're brilliant. Um, I was not, I got in my own way so much, um, but I really, wanted as I got into education I wanted to help empower people to make their own decisions and um and show them similarly how you did for me that there is a place for artists and that you can be your own thing and do your own thing and not be afraid of that and to really like take the time and space as you said uh that it took you decades to get into this place I think that um for the younger people listening um if you're like i don't have decades i have a wedding tomorrow or whatever it is right. um <clears throat> make sure you're picking up your camera and shooting in between i'd love to hear i know um I, I have to let you go but i'd love just as a last note um how much personal work do you do like uncommissioned just just for you you know it's it is less and less but um same <laughs> yeah i I mean, for years, because my wife's Irish, we spend a lot of time in Ireland, and I photograph much more over there because I'm going on a, a mindset of um, this is for me sort of thing. Uh, so I don't shoot a ton, but I get a lot of important pictures to me. Um, but I'm not one of those photographers that if I got a grant, I would drive across America and photograph. I don't work in that way. What's so unique about magazines and uh, the commercial work I did and the weddings is they get me into these specific places I'd never see otherwise. So you know, I've shot, I've shot portraits, I've shot magazine jobs in forty nine out of fifty states, missing Alaska if anybody has an assignment there or a wedding. Um, but, but I've always gotten into. Uh, you know, grandmother's cabin in the Adirondacks for a wedding or uh, a, a unique place on a mountaintop that, you know, you get the address and you show up and you take the picture and you're like, that was wild that I got that job and that I saw this place. So I'm, uh, I'm used to reacting to a specific 
uh, assignment or specific date and time to take a picture. So I don't shoot that much personally, but um, I document our life here in the Berkshires and, and that's, that's really nice. Oh, I love that. There's um, a favorite Sontag quote of mine that a photographer, allow, a camera allows you to become a tourist in another person's reality. And then the second that it goes further to say, and eventually in one zone, um, which I love that so much. And I feel like it's almost perfect of what you're saying, where like you love being that tourist in another person's reality, but you're being careful to make sure you're not becoming a tourist in your own, um, yes. which I was that like super angsty teen who I was obsessed with the musical Rent. Um, and there's <laughs> always, um, I feel like I'm exposing a whole new part of myself here, um, but there's um, all these lines that Jonathan Larson, who is such an artist, um, such a poet wrote in Rent about Mark's character um, hiding behind his camera and hiding behind his work. Oh, wow. And I think that's something that we have to be careful not to do where like, yes, she, especially if you're newer, like John, you're in a very different place than I think a lot of people who are maybe tuning in. So I'll say if you haven't been working for 20 years and you are worried about that wedding on Saturday, uh, maybe don't like take time away from your kids or whatever it is and become that tourist in your own reality. I don't, it doesn't matter what you're photographing. Maybe it's your pet, maybe it's an apple, but if you're concerned about a certain skill, making sure you're treating it like a wedding is the big game and you're practicing and honing your craft outside of the big game. Like I say, like you would never practice a play for the first time at the Super Bowl. You would make sure you know what you're doing before. So if you haven't been working for as long as, as John, I would say taking that time. It's, I mean, I think it's that thing of saying yes to a lot of things and just in the two stories you mentioned, all of a sudden I, I came to mind that I photographed Jonathan Larson before he died. I mean, clearly before he died, but shortly before he died, um, because I, one of my brides was working on a small film and he was on set and I did a portrait of him and I had never seen Rent. I never knew who he was, but I got this a beautiful picture of him just... Uh, he was sitting in a corner taking notes on the play or on the short film they were making. Um, and oh, I also so photographed. Jealous. He uh, died also... opening night. So it was before yes. anyone had seen it. He had, exactly. a, he had um, I think a heart attack. It was some, something horrible. And he died so young. Yes. But I also photographed Susan Sontag because I was taking pictures for Mount Holyoke College, you know, taking pictures for the brochures. And she showed up. And it was in a seminar room with 20 women and I had my Roloflex and I was sitting on the floor taking pictures and she turned to me and she said, young man, could you please stop? You're disturbing me. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, shut down by Susan Sontag. Like I was so quiet and so respectful, but I was messing with her reality and so I packed up and went home, which was fine with me, but that was pretty good to be chastised by Susan. That's pretty iconic. That's an, yeah. another person who died way too young. Um, yeah. And I always, I I want, I want that window into like her and Annie Leibovitz's life together and what that yes. was like with the camera. Oh, how, how I wish I could have that little, that window to peek into. But that's, as I said, I feel like we could do a hundred podcast episodes and I will not keep you. I want to yeah. thank you so much for being with me today. And this was incredible. Uh, I fun. will, everything we've chatted about, I'll make sure you guys are in the show notes um, with John's Instagram to check out and the beautiful photo that we chatted about. Thank you so much for being with us. This, this was incredible. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. This is great. We'll